Ten sons before giving Isaac, he gave the first when he only had one to give. Abraham had only the promise of having more sons. It took faith for Abraham to offer Isaac, faith that God respected and blessed. And God did the same for us. He gave his first in the form of his son, his first and only begotten son, who was given to us while we were still sinners. God gave Jesus in faith that we might one day give our lives to Him. The gift of His Son came before the blessing of our repentance and salvation. We give our first fruits in much the same way. Before we see the blessing of God, we give it in faith. Giving the first fruits of your income says to God, I recognize you first. I am putting you first in my life, and I trust you to take care of the rest. Amen. I guess the answer to the question today is, do I trust him to handle the rest and to take care of the rest? It's good to see you this morning. <laughs> Come on, y'all wake up. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know that that may be a little bit convicting of the video, but come on, let's wake up. The video obviously is part of our series that we've been in. Remember I shared with you that uh, over the last several years I went back and looked at where we were in teaching in, in regards to giving. Last year I preached on it twice, year before that twice, year before that once, and the year before that a couple of times. And uh, there was a time when we'd come into this particular study and we'd do four to six weeks. And uh, I really feel the need to get at, back to that. And you say, why? Because one thing, as with this video, if you were paying close attention to it, this whole idea of giving is worship. It's all about faith. It's all about our, our relationship to the Lord. It's in every aspect of our life. It not just affects my giving, it affects my living, the way I live my life. It, it affects the stewardship of my time and my, the resources, my family. Everything plays into this that all that we do, we do is unto the Lord. Amen? Every part of our life. And you can't dissect parts and say, well, I, I'll give that to God, but I don't want to give that to God. It's, it's really... You know, you come to Jesus and you lay yourself on the altar before the Lord and he becomes your Lord and you become a brother in Christ. You become a child of God. You become one of his, his priests. You become a holy saint. At that point, God does a work in your life. This really is about when we talk about money and giving, it really all is about faith. Will we learn how to trust the Lord? Can I believe God? You know, our problem is that we're raised in a secular world with a secular mindset the Bible refers to that as the flesh, you know, and we live with this fleshly mindset of how we approach our life. 
But we somehow have got to get to the place as children of God to remember that this is a book of miracles. This is a book of God's grace. This is a book where God teaches us how to not live a life that's controlled by the world, but controlled by his word. And what I pray as we have these particular studies is not that the church giving goes up or that you give. It really is down. God refurbish our faith. Challenge us to have a living faith that really does touch every part of our lives. We need to get supernatural, really, in our approach to living. All too often we live our lives like the world lives their lives. We shouldn't live our life that way. This is a life that God's given us, and he's given us a whole new way to live it. The Bible makes it clear. If any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creature, a new creation. Old things, they die, all right? The old way we live, the old way of thinking, the old way of living our life, that goes out the window. All things have become new. The last part of that verse says, and all things are of God. So we learn how to live our life according to the word of God. We learn how to live our lives according to the will of God. I mean, if you think about it, there's really nothing reasonable about this book. As you go through, I mean, what, what's really reasonable? God takes Moses out of Egypt. He's 40 years on the backside of the desert. All he has is a bunch of sheep and a rod, which he shepherds those sheep with. That's all he's got. And God tells him, all right, I want you to go back to Egypt and lead the people out to, 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 and take them to the place that I'm going to show you. Free the people. Well, how are you going to do that? It's impossible. One man with a shepherd's stick. That's going to do it? How? Where, where are the weapons? Where's the army? I'll take care of that. I'm God. And that rod you hold in your hand, that will be termed later the rod of God. Gideon. The Amalekites, the Midianites, the Amorites are coming up like locusts and swarming the land. I want you to rid the land of the Amalekites. All right, let me get an army together. He gets 100,000 men together, which is no way near what the Amalekites and the Malachites and all the other kites have. There's no way near they're going to deal with them. How are we going to do this? Guys, all right, here's how we're going to do it. Take them down the water. I'm going to reduce them. He ends up with 300 men. There's nothing logical about that. Joshua. We're going to take the city of Jericho. Okay, Lord, let's do it. How are we going to do it? Where's the army? Just to get everybody together, march around the city one time for, for six days. And on the seventh day, I want you to march around the city seven times. And at the end of the seventh time, I want the trumpets to sound and the priest to give a shout and the walls are going to come down. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to do it that way, God. <laughs> what do you really want to do? What's the real plan? That is the real plan. Somehow we, we've forgotten this whole thing. We, it's all right for Bible people to live lives of faith. But what about God's people? You know, what about God's people? Some people, well, the preacher lives by faith. No, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. So if you're a child of God and you're justified as a child of God, you've been called into faith living. You don't have a way out of that. In fact, what God does so often, in a, if we choose to live in a fleshly, carnal Christian life, God continues to work in us to put us into these in what I call impossible situations so as to draw us out to him like, like Peter in the boat in the storm, remember? And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, I want, bid me to come to you. I want to be where you are. And the Lord says, come. And Peter gets out of the boat. That's not logical. He's in the storm. He's walking on the water until he starts looking at the waves. And then he starts to drown. And he does the smart thing and calls out for Jesus to rescue him. It's a, there's not really any difference in those guys' lives, although we may not be told to get out of the, of the boat out on Lake Houston, but God is constantly calling us out of the boat of the norm and the ordinary of this life. And all too often, God's people refuse to take up the challenge and they get comfortable in their carnality, comfortable in their logical approach to life, comfortable in the way they're functioning. When we get to the place no longer we rule by the word of God and the will of God and the spirit of God, we get ruled by our flesh and by our emotions and by our circumstances. And we get real moody and real, you know, we just live in and out of despair because we haven't learned what it means to live by faith. How am I going to live this life? It's a supernatural life. And I, I don't need to rely upon 
my logic. I need to rely upon the Word of God. In fact, for the Christian, the only logical thing to do is to trust what God says. Jesus said, he gave us an illustration when he told the disciples, he said, listen, he said, the things that I do is not me, he says, the Father does them through me. I just say what he tells me to say and I do what he tells me to do. That's faith living. We live our life according to what God leads us to do and how he tells us to live our life. And it's laid out very clearly in the Bible. The Word of God teaches us how to live this faith life. And I really do believe that far too many Christians today don't have any real grip on living a faith life. I mean, how much of my life, let me put it in maybe a little simpler for it, how much of my life today really depends upon God and God coming through and God being God in my life? If I open my spiritual eyes, I will discover everything. My whole life depends upon God. But all too often, I don't live it that way, do I? I live in a way that just seems logical and rational and reasonable to the rest of the world. And as long as I fit in, as long as I don't cause any waves, as long as I just kind of give in to, to what the world's doing and, and where the world's going, you know, and I, I just don't move out. We need to stop questioning where we're at, stop worrying about what's logical, and just do what God tells us to do. Then your life changes. Then you begin to live a supernatural life. You follow the life of Jesus. He's constantly teaching those disciples that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's called faith. I hear what God says to me. I respond to what God says to me. I obey what God says to me. God pulls me into situations that seem difficult. They're not difficult. They're not impossible because he's there and he's telling me what to do. Just follow. The Bible says in 2 Peter that God has given us according to his divine power and our knowledge that we have of him. He's given unto us all things that pertain unto life and all things that pertain unto godliness. And how does he do that? He says he's called us and given to us his exceeding great and precious promises. You know what the problem is today? What's the problem? Many people lack daring discipline. Are you with me? Many people, or rather say we live by faith, and not live by faith. There's a lot of people who go through religiosity. Circumstantially, everything kind of looks like they're really going on with God, but God really doesn't have a whole lot to do with what is going on in that particular situation. There's not a lot that's happening there. Now, if you're not part of that team, you don't need to go, okay, guys? Period. <laughs> All right? We have a team that responds to situations and search where somebody's having a problem. But what happens is we just lack the discipline that God requires and calls us to in our life. And so all too often, it's kind of like mama bird kicking baby bird out of the nest. We've got to kick, be kicked out of the nest to fly. You say, well, Brother Joe, what makes you so certain that I'm not really living this life of faith? It's between you and God, ultimately, amen. But do understand this. That God calls to the body shepherds. And shepherds should respond to the flock's needs and meet the needs and speak to the needs and address the needs. Feed, supply, care for, you know, recover, rescue, whatever it might be. I'll give you an illustration I'm talking about. I probably haven't in 10 years. Look through the given records of the individual members of the, of the church we have. I don't have any problem with doing that. I believe that you know, falls into well my responsibilities. And right there, if I feel like there's a need to, to, to discover where that need is and address that need and speak to that need. I would, I would tell you this, after going through the records, all right, and after just looking through the list, I, you say, how can you know if somebody tithes? I don't know what you make, so I don't know if you tithe, all right? But I would say, if that tithe represents 10% of what you make, what's on that record, you need to come to the church for, for some help. We, we have a benevolence fund that helps people in desperate needs. Amen. And we'll be glad to minister to you and help you with that, that tremendous need that you're facing because I don't see how you can even pay your rent if that represents a portion of your income and a first fruits offering of your income. No, I know some of you don't think you'll look. Hey, that's, you know, that, I'm a shepherd. That's my responsibility. My responsibility is to address the need, is it not? And to speak to the needs and to minister to people in whatever those needs might be. I mean, if you just want kind of a spiritual janitor, I quit. Because <laughs> that's not what God called me to be. Kathy thinks so. Amen. God didn't call me to be the spiritual maintenance guy. I sweep up after the mess. Come in when it's well too late. God wants me to speak before you make the mess. 
God wants me to teach you the truth before you fall into the pit. Amen. And so that's why we talk about not just giving, soul winning, discipleship, Bible studies, scripture memorization, all the things that we teach on, just going through the words of God and the books of the Bible like we do, are all given to equip you for the work of the ministry. But if there's a need that's not being taken care of or for somehow, for some reason has slipped and fallen, then we address that need. Now, I know that there's times we all go through difficult issues and difficult times. I know a lot of folks have lost their jobs in recent months and been rehired and I'm still looking for jobs, but you know, it's my responsibility to help you. And I will never be able to help you any more than your doctor would be able to help you if I can't tell you the truth. And the truth is this, that we need to hear what God has to say about money. And realize that it's a big portion of our life. And even as we discussed, you know, about getting out of debt last week and giving those principles for how you can approach your debt crisis and how you can be free and no longer be a slave to the lender, how that God wants you to be that person who's a lender and not a slave to those things. God wants to be you to be the generous person. God wants you to be the person who blesses other people, not always be in need of something. That biblical prosperity is God meeting your needs because you're an obedient, faithful child and you have enough to meet others' needs. That's real prosperity. God gives to me and honors me and blesses me with enough to give and enough to minister and enough to reach out as well as take whatever, care whatever those particular needs might be in my life. So when I preach this issue today, I, I, what I'm doing in preaching this particular message in this series, where we are right now, is to give you an opportunity to open the doorway for you to launch yourself out into a whole new way of living your life, a life that can transform you. Now, I believe with all my heart that most of you know these principles but as scripture tells us, as Peter said, I want to stir up your minds. I want you to remember. I don't want you to forget what God's taught you. I don't want you to forget what you hear because we are forgetful hearers many times. And we learn a lesson and walk in it and then we begin to make excuses and we get that rational, fleshly, carnal mind start working in us and we just miss God. But today in listening to what I'm sharing you, realize that this is an outlet, you know. This is a way of stepping out on what God says. There's no denying in scripture that God... God wants us to be a generous people. He doesn't want us bound up. He wants our life to be characterized by being a person who's available to him. He says in, in, in Proverbs, hey, honor the Lord from your wealth, from the first fruits of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. He said, you honor me. Honor me, I'll honor you. Bring, bring a portion of what I've blessed you with. That's all he's asking. In scripture, it goes on to tell us in, in Proverbs 11, there's one who scatters and yet increases. All the more. And there's one who does what? There's one who withholds what's justly due, what he ought to give. And it results in only want. The generous man will be prosperous. But he who waters will not... He, he, and he who waters will himself be watered. What's he saying is? So there's some guys out here that are supposed to sow. What's it mean to scatter? It means I'm giving seed to the ground. He says this person, he's giving seed away. It's being thrown out into the dirt. And it comes back and it increases. And there's another guy who has seed, but he doesn't, he doesn't sow it. And he's suffering. He has needs all the time because he won't sow. We'll see in a moment there's a passage where God says he gives seed to the sower. What's this guy do? He's been given seed, but he won't plant it. It's like the guy with the talents. You remember him? And he just hid it. He didn't put it to use. So what we need as we get into this message is to realize that God wants us to be this kind of person, the one who's gracious to the poor, the one who lends to the Lord, the one who's repaid for what he's done. Who repays him? The Lord does it. Proverbs 28, he who gives to the poor will, will never want. Malachi 3 is a passage many people are familiar with. Bring your tithes, bring your offerings into the storehouse. Now what it's talking about here in the context of the New Testament church, this is not the Levitical tithe, all right? Now specifically in the context, when we talk about context, the principle's still here for us. The context is the children of Israel. They weren't, they weren't bringing their tithes as they were commanded in the law to do. Now, if you follow that principle of tithes, all that means a, a portion of 10%, there were multiple tithes, about 33 and a third percent in all by the time you took the temple offerings and the offerings for the poor and all those other offerings in the Old Testament. Those people were giving around 33% of their income according to the law. But what scripture does teach us long before the law is instituted, like you saw in the video, there is a principle that even Adam and Eve must have known about it because they taught Cain and Abel the principle of giving and worship and bringing a portion and bringing first fruits. That was taught long before the law came hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later through Moses. New Testament 
basically talks about a, this portional giving and setting aside as you want to see the Lord bless you. It talks about it, it talks about us giving. But I think the Old Testament just serves as a model. But ultimately, that, that's just a model. It's a place where we can begin. It's a place where we can start. When the Lord tells us that we're to be givers and we're to be people who are, you know, participating. Well, look at Luke 6, 38. If you give, you will receive. It's basically what it says. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, for by the standard that you measure it out, it will be measured back to you. What's he saying here? Give. Now, how many of you know that's not a suggestion? Even in the Greek structure of this verb, it is a command. Give. And it will be given to you. How? More than what you gave. In fact, he says, if you give a little more, you'll get a little more. If you give a lot more, you'll get a whole lot more. You'll give a little spoonful, give a shuffle, how you want to give it. However you decide to give it, it'll be given back to you. So do you want a little? Do you want a larger amount? Depending on, on what you give, he says, hey, what you have here, folks, is a command, but it's also a promise. It's a promise from God. But it's also part of the principles of God's Word. Let me tell you something else it is. It's something everybody in this room can do. It's something we can all participate. We've talked about all the verses over the last few weeks that are in Scripture about this principle of sowing and reaping and giving. But they're, they're, they're principles that God has set in place. These are God-ordained principles. Things which if somebody hadn't shared with me many years ago, I probably would have wasted a lot of time and not been able to do a whole lot of ministry that God called us to do. But you need to understand, when we talk about biblical principles, it means this is a standard by which God does something. Or this is the way, mark it down, in which God works. You know, we can call it laws, you can call it facts, you can call it principles, you can call it truth. It's all the same. But these are things that God has set in place. Give and it shall be given unto you is a standard that God has put out. Listen, this. God doesn't work by magic. All right? God works by his word. And God's word is how we live a life of faith. I believe what God has said in his word. Therefore, I stand on it. I trust it. And then I believe it. Give and it shall be given unto you. This passage in, 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 in 2 Peter, I mentioned just a while ago, it says that his, his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and to godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. What's he saying? Excellence and glory. God's called you by that. He's called you to a relationship. He's basically saying, you now know him. How am I going to live for Jesus? He said, well, he's granted to us precious and magnificent promises. That's the word of God. So that by them, the word of God, the promises of God, by them you can participate in the divine nature. You can escape the corruption that's in the world by selfish, carnal, fleshly desire. That's why it holds most people in bondage. You just want more, want more, want more. Not just talking about sexual lust, you're right. He's talking about just greed. He's talking about covetousness, the, the mindset that says, if I get more, I'll be happy. If I can just have more, I'll be happy. So you have this principle from the word of God. God says, all right, here's the way I'm going to work in your life. Here's the way you're going to experience me, participate in my life. Take my word, read it, and believe it. Take my word, hear it, respond to it. Do what I tell you to do. Well, what is your word? Let me give you quickly today just a few principles from the word of God that they've probably been put to you before in other sermons if you've been a Christian very long in different ways and different formats, but they're still all the same and they're still true. All right? These are true. This is not something you can reverse. This is something God said he would do if you do this. The first principle is this, a simple principle. We call it the law of supply and demand. In Hebrews, it says it in the Amplified Bible like this. His works had been completed and prepared and waiting for all who would believe since the foundation of the world. God said, before I created the planet, before I did creation, I did everything in my head, everything in my heart, and everything in heaven, laid it out how it was all going to be. All right? In fact, which came first? You know, people say the chicken or the egg. Let me ask you this. Which came first? Lungs or Adam? I'll put it this way. It's better, excuse me. It, it, it lungs or air is what I would say. Did God create Adam with his lungs or did he create air first? He created air first, right? If God hadn't created air before he created Adam, there wouldn't have been much of a story. 
and drop dead. <laughs> it's all over. The end. But let me tell you this. When Adam sinned, did God know that Adam was going to sin? Yes. Revelation tells us that he, that, that, that God had slain the lamb before the foundations of the earth. What does that mean? In other words, long before there was a need for a savior, God had already provided one for in, in heaven. In the mind of God, Jesus had been already crucified long before Adam was, was created. That's what it tells us in scripture. So it's telling us here, God's already completed and prepared and has everything waiting before the, since the foundation of the world. So it, it's not like, you know, that, I, that, that there's nothing I'm ever going to need that God doesn't know about. He's already got it ready. There's nothing I'm ever going to face that God's going to be caught by surprise. God's got everything ready. There's no situation I'm ever going to stumble. Oh, God, what am I doing here? God knows what you're doing there. God knows what he wants you to do while you're there. He's got everything laid out. Every need you will ever have. You say, but I don't even know what those are. He does. He knows what those needs are before you ever have them. And he says here, I've already taken care of it. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Somebody praise the Lord. Amen. Let me put it simply. So long before I ever have a need, God has a supply. Long before I ever have a need, God has a supply. He said, well, Joe, my needs aren't being met. Well, maybe you're not following the word. In fact, if God's not just meeting your basic needs, there really are some problems here. Because if you study the, the Old Testament, the children of Israel, they were, they were the biggest batch of Baptist backsliders you'd ever see. Yeah, I know they were Jewish. I'm just being humorous. Remember them? They were always in rebellion. They never would get it right. In fact, that whole generation died after 40 years, that first generation that came out of Israel. But even in their miserable backslidden state, the Lord still provided for them. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. They didn't go hungry. They, God provided water. God provided the manna. God met every need that they had. Didn't met all their wants particularly, but he did meet their needs. I just believe it's within the natural flow of God as Father God to provide for his children and to meet the basic needs. But if we would learn what the Bible says, then we'd learn how to realize and understand that, hey, you know, God wants to meet all the needs in my heart and life. And there's a way which I can literally just tap into that by just believing what he says and understanding and being obedient to what he says, that there's a supply for my demand. Now, part of that is what we would call this, this principle here, the principle of sowing. The principle of sowing is a universal law. You reap what you sow. You with me on that? What do you sow? Whatever you reap. Galatians puts it this way. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. Whatsoever. You know what that means in the Greek? Whatsoever. Whatever you give, you, can, you will get back. How many of you are sitting here today thinking, man, this is not a very friendly group of people? You probably go to work and say the same That's not a very friendly group of people. Then you get out and say, this is not a very friendly group of people. The Bible says if you want people to be friendly to you, Proverbs says you must first show yourself Hello? It kind of puts it back on us, doesn't it? It puts it back on us. If I want to be, have friends, I must be a friend. Well, nobody loves me. Well, maybe you need to start loving somebody. Nobody cares about it. Maybe you need to start caring about somebody. You reap what you sow. And the kind of seed determines the kind of crop. I mean, this is seen in Genesis, even in creation. The, the Bible says that every, everything brought forth fruit after its own kind. God created the tree, and in the tree was a seed capable of reproducing more trees just like that tree. God produced the corn, and in the corn came a seed, and the seed produces just whatever it is. But the principle is, it has to be sown. It has to be placed out there. It has to be committed. It has to be given. Give, and it shall be given. That's the scripture we read a while ago from Luke 6, 38. Give, and it shall be given. Whether you give or not is important now. If I don't give, then I'm not receiving. Now, I don't give just to receive, but I give because God told me to give so I can receive. And guess what? I can give some more. And there's this principle like the one who, who has seed for sowing and he sows it and he keeps scattering and he keeps producing fruit in his life. The kind of seed, though, determines the kind of crop. What goes out? Well, how does that work? I wish I knew. 
Mark puts it this way when Jesus speaks in the book of Mark. He said, and Jesus was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and he gets up in the day and the seed sprouts up and grows. How? Well, he himself doesn't know. The soil produces crops by itself. The blade, the head, the mature grain in the head. What's he saying? The farmer goes out. He doesn't have to understand the agricultural phenomena of seed and soil. He just needs to plant the seed. And in planting it, under not even understanding it, just doing what he knows to do, then something happened. It's within the very principles of the dynamics of God's law that something takes place and it begins to bring forth fruit itself. And out of that fruit comes more fruit. I mean, I wish I'd stop and got a, an ear of corn today just to show you this. I think I've done that before sometimes in years past. But if you take a, a, an ear of corn, you know, that came from one little kernel of corn, right? It was planted, and out of that came the stalk, and out of that came two, maybe three, if you're really good farmer, three or four ears of corn, all right? On each ear of corn, it's phenomenal. One little corn, four ears of corn, on each ear of corn are hundreds of little corns. <laughs> All right? Count them. Might be eight or ten around and twenty down. To, it's, it's, it's tremendous. It's phenomenal. I mean, am I the only one that thinks that's incredible? That's, that's unbelievable. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking to myself, that farmer's a smart guy. That's a good investment. One stinking little piece of corn... And you get three or four ears of corn loaded up with little corns. That's a lot of corn. And that's just corn. Jesus didn't die for corn. He died for you. If he'd do that for corn, what's he going to do for you? Somebody will say amen. But you've got to give the corn. It has to be planted. In fact, he says how it happens he said it happens by itself. By itself is a phrase that means automate. It's translated in the Greek language, automate. No, it's, it's just automatic. It's a principle and action. It's something that God's set in, in, in course to happen. It's just automatic. That when it's given, something happens. And it begins to reproduce. It's just automatic. So, first of all, is this, this, this God's going to meet your need. Second of all, we have the fact that, you know, you're going to have to take this corn, whatever it might be, the dollars, the cents, and you're going to have to sow them. And what happens... You're going to reap from that. It's the principle of reaping. You reap and you reap, but you're also reaping what you sow. You're reaping more than you sow. You're reaping later than you sow. Second Corinthians says, but I say, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. Every man, listen to this, every person, according as they purpose in their heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, not of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the proportion is according to how you give it. In other words, how much do you want back? How much you want put in? You say, I don't believe that. Well, you tell God that. He wrote it. I'm just quoting it. Amen? I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot me. And the messenger, or that the message is this, that, hey, you're giving to be given. You're pressed down, shaking together. You know? In fact, in, in context, we always talk about context, context, context when we study the Bible, right? In context, you know what he's talking about here? Money. In fact, he's speaking about a, a, these people have gotten be, done more than just he told them to bring their regular gifts. Now he's addressing them contextually on the basis of a pledge they'd made to help a church in Jerusalem. He says, all right, guys, you, you know, you, you said you're going to give it, give it. Put your money where your mouth is. You said you were going to do that, but now you haven't done it. But I'm here to take the offering back to the church in Jerusalem. So you give it. And how do you want to get it back? You determine in your own heart. But whatever you do, whether you give a little, whether you give a lot, do, do as an act of worship. God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, I'm not central in this. It's not about me. It's about the glory of God. It's about the ministry. It's about others. It's not about making me the center of attention here. But I will receive proportionally to how I give. One man says, you've got to give to get. Well, let's add it to that. You've got to give to get so you can give, so you can get, so you can give. And you do it according to the measure, depending how you want it back. Luke 6, 38 says, so it'll come back to you, press down, Shaking together, running over, and catch this. Will men give into your bosom? In other words, God says, I'm going to make somebody give it back to you. I'm going to tell somebody to give it back to you. You're going to get it back. 
It's not going to appear magically in your living room one morning. Where you go, oh, look at a basket of money. No, I got, I just, I'll, just, I'll get somebody to get it to you. Who's he going to get to give to you? Somebody else that's faithful. You'll find another faithful believer. You'll get it back. You'll receive a blessing. God, this is not a lie, and this is not just some kind of fairy tale, and this isn't Aesop's fables. This is reality. You can get in the center of God's will in your finances and get excited about what God does. And this is not something I'm just preaching about. This has been a living message for me ever since probably the third week I was saved when somebody sat down with me, a guy by the name of Manly Beasley sat down with my brother and myself, said, you guys are starting out in ministry. I'm going to give you the principles to succeed in life and in your ministry. Have you got 15 minutes? Man, I'll give you 30 for that. I'll give you an hour. He says, here it is, guys, some simple principles. God owns everything. Nothing earth than here, no. But if you want to get in on it, you're going to have to give. If you don't give, you don't get. If you don't get in on God's principles. But if you give, God will give back to you. And you'll reap what you sow. And you'll reap more than you sow. So you decide how much more you want to give. A little bit more, a, little, a, a, a less more. Because you'll receive it proportionally how you're going to do this. And if you'll follow these principles and believe God and do it as an act of faith and an act of worship to God, you'll see God work on your behalf. And you'll be, able to, you'll be able to supply the needs for the ministry that you have. Because if you're going to have a faith ministry, you don't want to have to be out there begging people to give every time you get up to preach. That's not the will of God. This is not the way it works. But we looked at each other in profound amazement. Young Christian. We were living together in a house. Doing weekend ministry. We had, a, we had a garage that had been converted into our little mini auditorium. We'd stick about 70 to 100 kids in that garage every Friday and Saturday night. Bill was probably taking about 70 bucks a week. I was taking 50 bucks a week. Big money. 21 years of age. We went home and I looked at Bill and said, I ain't got nothing to give. I ain't got nothing to give. I don't either. We started looking around and said, what can we get? I mean, literally, we went throughout the house and we began to bring in the living room stuff we could give away. Clothes, shoes, stuff in the house, anything we thought we could give away. We, and we, we, we just found a place. We went down to Goodwill and Salvation Army and started giving stuff they needed there and gave some stuff there. All right, we gave. So we're, we're waiting with expectation. What's God going to do? Yeah. Within probably 36 to 48 hours. Our biggest need was this ministry, how we were going to do that, how we were going to meet all these kids that were coming in because that number was growing weekly. Kathy was a part of that ministry in those early days. She knows what I mean. These people, people come all over Houston to come out there. We had a guy knock on the door. Both Phil and I were there at the house. He welcomed him in. He came big tears streaming out his eyes. He said, listen, he said, I pastor the Friends Church over here. Friends is, is, is a Quaker church. He said, I cannot get you guys off my mind. He said, I've prayed about this. So the last couple of days, it's been heavy on my heart. He said, I know what you're doing. I see the ministry. I see so many people's lives being changed. He said, I just know. I, can you guys use a building? Our church would like to give you a building. They can choose the building. Use shoes for new I'm, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> That works for me. And these are work we had to get, but you know, that place became a station for several years of a lot of people coming to know Jesus and a lot of people's lives being changed. But it started away giving some stuff away. Some of y'all got so much junk you don't know what to do with it. Hoarders. Husbands are looking at wives, wives are looking at husbands. You know, if we just we just missing all these blessings because we just won't learn a simple principle. This principle works. A few years after that, after I separated myself and gone to another, started our own ministry and God was getting us going, we were moving forward. And, you know, I'm out there and made a commitment to full-time ministry. Kathy's working as a secretary. You know, I walked her one day and said, you know, I said, uh, I believe God wants us to start a radio program. Excuse me? Yeah. Do what? I said, I believe God wants us to start a radio program. We had a radio program. We started and it went in about four state areas. Uh, just to do one, it was, it was around three or four dollars a week, I think. It's like fifty dollars a program, you know, for each day, one fifty minutes a day. And uh, I said, I said, I, I said, I went and I talked to him and got the contract for doing this radio program. And I, I, I believe God wants me to sign it, and I had the first fifty dollars. 
So let's do it. And we did that program for four, five, six years, I guess. You know, we were on there. And the reason we went off, not because we didn't have the money there, but God told us it's time to stop that particular ministry. This church sits here today. The Magnolia campus sits out there today because people moved in faith. People moved in faith. They did something that was out of the ordinary, but it was the will of God. They did something unexpected and they gave. I believe we can give our way to a blessing. And it's not for the sake of, of uh, this, 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 uh, this carnal prosperity the world talks about, just wealth and riches, you know. God give you whatever you want. That's not it at all. We've talked about that before. But it is about the fact that there are some things that God wants to accomplish through my life that are bigger than me and things that He wants to accomplish through your life that are bigger than you. But if you're a tightwad or you're selfish or you're greedy or you're living as a carnal person and you just can't let go because you can't make it without it, you're never going to do anything. You're never going to do anything. I said to my wife a couple years after that, I said, you know, I, I think that God wants you on the road with me, traveling. And you're working, and this isn't working out. She said, what do you mean it ain't working out? It's more than half our income. <laughs> About two-thirds of our income. I said, yeah, but I think God wants you to be with me. Well, what are we going to do? She said, we're just going to give and trust God. We're going to give and trust God. She walked in, gave two weeks' notice, and walked out, and God's met us every since that day. has never failed to meet the need. How did you get back? We gave a little more. We gave more. And in giving more, it met the need to receive more. And some folks are so busy working with their little calculator. Well, if I get anything, I just can't make it. I can't, I can't pay Visa if I pay them. You know, hey, you pay God first. You die, you ain't facing Visa. <laughs> you're facing God. Amen? And by the way, you're not trusting Visa. They may stop my credit. That'd be the best thing ever happened to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just get rid of it. But the principle of reaping is reality. And if you don't take time to reap, then you will not receive. You know, and these are principles that, you know, that, that as I talk, I, I could go on for hours and hours because it's exciting to me to see what God does and what God will do when we just sit down and intentionally begin to believe what God says. You know, there's a lot of people who just don't want to walk into that passage. A lot of people are willing to sit back and claim Philippians 4.19. My God will supply all my need according to His riches in Christ Jesus. That's a promise from God, is it not? But remember, with every promise, there's a, re a, a premise. And the premise of that chapter is found just a couple of verses before it in that chapter where it says, because you gave a gift more than once for my needs, God's going to meet your needs. That's the principle of what he's saying there. You have been a blessing. You've been given. And you can be sure because you've been giving, my God's going to supply your needs again. That's the promise of Scripture. That's the premise of the promise. And we're sitting around wanting God to meet my needs, but I don't want to let go of anything. I can't afford to let go of anything. I think. Because I, my thinking is stinking. Amen? But my thinking needs to line up with the Word of God. But Brother Joe, it doesn't make sense. Neither does. If I want to live, I have to die. Neither does if I want to be exalted, I must be abased. Neither does if I want to receive, I have to give. That's the logic of the scripture. It doesn't make sense to men, but it's the wisdom of God. And when we start operating our lives by the wisdom of God, man, what God will do and how God will meet every need of our life. The last principle is this. You do what you do with intention. You do what you do with intentional faith. Now, I remember talking to a, to a, to a guy that was a... Uh, a treasurer of a church one time, and I t he was telling me about how they were having such suffering times in, their, in the church's income. I said, what they were going to do is they were going to stop all their mission giving. I said, what? He said, we, we just, you know, we can't afford it. We're going to stop all our mission giving. I said, I think I'd find some other places to cut the budget before I'd cut my giving. Because giving is the avenue by where God meets our needs. It's the, it's, it's the faucet we open to keep, the, you know, to keep the rain coming, to keep the windows of heaven open. We honor the Lord we, with our substance. And because we honor God, God, honor, oh, I just think that's selfish and greedy. That was his response. Now, I won't tell you what I was thinking, but it was thinking. <laughs> I just said, sir, you, your, your theology is very weak. The Bible says give and it will be given. In fact, everything about faith... You know, it has an expectation to it. I mean, I called on Jesus with an expectation of salvation. 
I called on Jesus with an expectation of eternal life. I called on Jesus with an expectation he was going to deliver me and set me free from my sins and liberate my life. There was an expectation, amen? But God, God puts that in our heart and life. To, Here's what I want to do for you. Will you trust me? Will you believe me? Can I take you deeper? Can, I, can I, we climb this mountain together or are you going to stay at the bottom? You know? There's this, there's this intentional, I'm going to trust God. And to do that, the intention is that I, I have to sow. I have to sow. And now we see clearly, if I don't sow, then I don't receive. Isn't that right? So some would say, well, I can't sow. I can't afford it. But according to 2 Corinthians, if you go back and look at that, God said he gives seed to the sower. In other words, God gives you money to give. Well, I just don't see it. No, you spend it on something else. You invest it in something else. It might be your car payment. It might be your house payment. It might be, you know, MasterCard, Visa, Chase, or whoever, but you, you, you put it somewhere. You have the seed. You've been given the ability to, to sow the seed. Now God just wants you to be faithful with it. He's put it in your hands. What was that verse while ago in Proverbs? There's a guy who has it, and he uses it, and the other guy just holds it. And, he's, and he doesn't. This is what happens. When he holds it, he suffers want. What's that mean? He's holding it, and he doesn't have enough. You never have enough if you hold it. You're just not going to have enough. You're going to suffer all the time. You're always going to have more month than you do money. And everybody, anybody been there before? Yeah. But there's, there's, this, there's this deal in 2 Corinthians 9. It says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So what scripture telling us? Wrap this up. Each one we should do as we purposed in our heart. Not under compulsion, but God loves cheerful givers. There's this expectation in God's name. So you'll be excited. Why can I be so cheerful? Because I understand how it works. Now. I know what's going on. I know the method. I know the means. I know the maker. I know how it's all going to work out. I don't have to be bound by the world system. I can, I can be free. So basically when he says do it in your heart, what's he saying? You have to make a decision. The decision is you have to make a decision to sow. And you decide how much you want to sow in, in the process of that. But when you do it, you know, whether it's bountifully or sparingly, when you receive it's a blessing. But ultimately, as you give it, you know, you do it with heart. It's right. One thing I loved about the little preview pre, pre, video that we showed to, to start with, it's, it was just a, it's a beautiful illustration of what real worship is. Cain and Abel. One brother bringing the first of his flock. There's no guarantee that he'd get another. He just brought his an act of worship. What was he saying? I trust you, God. I tell people all the time, I say, when you write your checks to give, you always put a scripture verse on Luke 6, 38, Malachi 3, 10, 2 Corinthians 9, somewhere just another scripture about God's promises. You're basically saying, I'm, I'm intentionally doing this for the glory of God. I'm intentionally doing this for the cheer of heart. I'm intentionally honoring God. His will, His word, His kingdom, and what He wants to do in my life. And we can talk about all kinds of giving from tithing. People say, well, I give what I can afford. Some people say, well, I, I give a 10% portion. And others say, you know, I, I, just, I, I just give when I can and I, when I feel like I can really afford it. I believe there's a giving. This is when that guy sat down with my brother and I, he said this. Well, you have to, do is learn, you have to learn revelation giving. What's revelation giving? What God reveals. To you. Now, obviously God reveals his first fruits principle, right? It's the revelation of scripture right here. There's a first fruits principle long before the law. There's a first fruits principle. But I also believe there's other times when God just reveals you to do something you ought to do. Sometimes we pray about an offering, right? What do you want me to do, Lord? I believe God reveals it to our heart. Sometimes you don't have to be praying or thinking, and God just puts something on your heart you need to get. There's one time in, early on in our marriage when the Lord told Kathy, and it just spoke to my heart and went to Kathy, what do you think about this? I said, I feel like the Lord's speaking in my heart. There's this pastor that we had that, that was a very close brother and friend, and he was our pastor at the time. And I said, you know, I believe that the Lord wants us to give him a check, and I told him out. Now, it wouldn't be a big amount for us today, but back then it would probably it'd be like a big check, you know? And I said, she said, well, let's do it. That's what we're going to do. We put it in the mail, sent it off to him. We were in and out a lot. About four days later, he calls me and said, I just opened this envelope. What's this about? I don't know, Janice, it's just something you know, the Lord told me to do. I just felt it was on my heart. I, not my heart, but you know, I felt like I wanted to do that. And he starts crying. He says, he says you, don't, you don't understand. He said, I just got to move my mom past this morning. And I said, I don't 
I had to fly out there. I had no money for a flight. So this covers the flight. See that on my mind. Revelation gives. We don't know what God's doing, where somebody's going, what's going to happen to But if God tells us to do it, we ought to do it. But you know what? If we're stingy and tight, if we're bound up and can't do first fruits, we can't do the other. Because we don't have the seed for it. But what a glorious place when you get to the, your place in your life where you have seed for sowing. Because you're sowing. And you can do something. I mean, it's not about all you have in the morning. You can only drive so many cars. You can only put, you know, so many bedrooms in a house. You know, you can only have so many toys and TVs. Amen? Comes a time you realize that God's put it in your hands for other purposes. <laughs> that your life can make a difference. Nobody's ever remembered in history for what they keep. Great people we remember in history remember because of what they gave. Amen? So I want to encourage you today. Take this into your heart, man. But take it as a challenge to live a life of faith that will bring glory to God. And God can use you in ways you never really thought were possible before. You may be in a place right now that's very hard, it's very difficult, but I encourage you, and I can share a personal testimony if you want to come sit down and talk in my office, of what God will do when you'll start with where you are. Just start where you are. Start being obedient. Start being faithful. You'll see what God can do. The Bible says He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can pray. To God be the Lord. Let's stand with our heads back.